So I think uh, by now it's safe to say that Joe Biden won the election and will be the next president of the United States of America. Now, it will be a tough road ahead for him and his administration to lead the country with the rising corona pandemic cases and the worsening of economy and the ever widening division in the nation. The United States of America is a divided country, especially after the election. You see, on the surface, politically, there is a huge division between Democratic and Republican parties, the blue states against the red states, the blue neighborhoods against the red neighborhoods. And on the, street, on the streets, the division seems to be much more pronounced between those who wear facial, uh, face masks and those who don't. And in the trenches of people's minds and hearts, the feelings of bitterness and anger are brewing and growing ever more against one another. It's going to be very, very challenging to govern a nation as divided as the United States of America, whoever is the next president. Now, two things I need to clarify before I go any further. I'm not a political commentator. I'm not a political uh, pundit. I'm just an average concerned citizen who sees what's happening around the world and what's happening in our uh, neighborhood, country, and trying to make some sense out of it. I'm trying to read and understand the signs of our time so I can follow Jesus here and now more closely and faithfully. Now, secondly, I think division is dangerous. Division is dangerous. A sign of sickness in the body, of family, body, of neighborhood, body, of church, body, of community, and body of word. Division is bad. It's dangerous. Now, on the other hand, I truly believe that diversity is good, a sign of health. Diversity is good. We can be diverse and still be united as one. We can be many and even live in peace as one. The Bible says that there is one body but many body parts. Diverse and one. A body is healthy when the diverse body parts are working together. Diversity is good, but division is bad. A body cannot function as a living body when the body parts are separated and divided. A separated and divided body is a sick and dead body. A separated and divided community, neighborhood, country, and the world are not good. It's a sign of sickness. When we separate ourselves from our environment, our neighbors, and our world, we become sick. Our neighbors and our world suffer. Division tends to create walls and barriers, hostility, suspicion, and fear. Division fosters sameness, likeness. It's like, we like you because you are like us, same as us, and we hate you because you are not like us. Divided people tend to generalize, condemn, judge, and even demonize the other side without genuinely trying to hear the others, dismissing the others without taking time to have a dialogue to understand the differences. Division is not good at all. In, in the country down in South, the United States, I see a widening division and gap between people based on their skin colors and ethnicity, their ideology, their culture, their lifestyle, their religion, their politics and economy, a sign of sickness as a country and as a people. And the question and the challenge is, how do you close the gap, reconcile the division? Now, in today's Bible text, Matthew chapter 25, we read that Jesus describing what it would be like at the end, when he comes in his full glory, when the kingdom of God comes in Jesus Christ at the end. And he says, he will separate all the people into two groups. He will do it like a shepherd divides the sheep from the goats, sheep on the honored right side, goats on the left. 
There will be clear separation at the end. But he says, he says, until that time, until that time, until the coming of the Son of Man in his full glory, they are mixed together, sheep and goats. They live together, the righteous ones and the evil ones, the saints and the sinners, the good, the bad, and the ugly, all living together side by side in our community, in our family, in our church, and in our world until that time. Now, the tendency and the temptation for us, meanwhile, is to separate us from the others and labeling others as goats as we consider ourselves as sheep. And it's so easy to think like that, especially in light of the divided world we live in right now. Often the temptation for us is to separate and divide from either blue or red or from white or black, from rich or poor or Republicans or Democrats, Christians or Muslims, liberals or evangelicals, and on and on. But the truth is, we are not the judge. We don't get to decide. And we really don't know who is God or who is sheep. We think we know, but we don't. Jesus said, until he comes back, they are mixed together, sheep and goats. We think we know, but what we see and know are all on the surface, folks. On the surface, we really don't know the depth of another human being. Only God knows. I just read an article that another megachurch pastor in the States, got fired from his pastoral position from certain scandals gone on for many years. Many people thought that he was a saint, a sheep, but it turns out he was a wolf hiding under a sheep skin. We don't see a wolf hiding under a sheep skin until it's too late, and we get surprised. We get surprised and overwhelmed. We just never know, folks. We just never know. I bet you that we will all be shocked at the end who will be standing on the right or left of Jesus when he comes in full glory. We, we would be shocked. What, you, you are a sheep? And, and what, me, a goat? We just never know, folks. That's why we all need forgiveness. We all need God's mercy and forgiveness. And that's why we all need to be very, very careful about judging and condemning others just because they are different than us. We don't know, and we don't get to decide. Now, when Jesus comes in his full glory, he will separate the sheep from the goats. The separation occurs before either group is told what they have or haven't done or what the basis of separation is. The sheep are told before they know what they have done. Come, who you who are blessed by my Father, take your inheritance, the kingdom prepared for you since the creation of the world. Jesus says, take your inheritance. Take your inheritance. We, we miss the whole point of Jesus telling us this parable if we do not see that it is not their good deeds that get them the kingdom. They don't earn the kingdom. They inherit it. Inheritance is determined by the giver, not the receiver. There's not the slightest sense that somehow a person, you or I or anybody, could get the inheritance by doing something good or anything. As Paul tells the people in Rome, he says, it is a free gift. God's grace is a free gift from God. Well, okay, uh, let me just pause here a little bit uh, and for a moment and briefly explain to you about the nature of the kingdom of God. What is kingdom of God? Where is it? When is it? Who gets in? And how do you get in? And why do you want to get in at all? 
So what is kingdom of God? First, simply it's when and where Jesus rules the world in God's peace. Now that's a simple and static definition of the kingdom of God. But you can't really define the kingdom of God in a sentence and point to it. No, the kingdom of God is a living, moving, evolving, emerging, breaking in, an active and dynamic blossoming of God's presence in every aspect of our lives and in the universe. You see, we can't really define in one sentence and say this is the kingdom of God. We can't do that. So that's why when Jesus described the kingdom of God or kingdom of heaven, he told parables a lot. He used stories and metaphors and challenged us to imagine the best possible word we can ever dream of. And that's why John and his disciple used stories and metaphors in the book of Revelation when he described the heaven with the most expensive and precious jewels. It's like spectacular, spectacular scenes in the book of Revelation. When and where? Well, now when here, where we are, and later and there in heaven, the kingdom of God will come later in his full glory, but it's also here and now. In my heart, in my life, in every aspect of my life where Jesus is the king, it's available here and now, and we enter into it, and we also usher it into our word if we begin to live the way of Jesus and follow him here and now. Kingdom of God here and now. Some people think of kingdom of God or kingdom of heaven or heaven only in terms of tomorrow. When I die at the end of the age when Christ comes with the power and some utopian place, some luxurious retirement resort so the rationale goes, to get to that great retirement resort later, I have to do good and be good. Sort of invest now for the reward later, sort of kind of thinking. Invest now for your retirement later so you can relax on the sunny beach somewhere in Mexican village, drinking pina colada and just live like that forever. Well, I don't know what heaven will be like in the end when Christ reigns in full glory. But one thing that I know, I will be with Jesus day and night. I will be in God's presence, God's loving and peaceful presence, seeing God face to face as you see me right now. Every day will be the best day of my life, and the next day will be the better day than today. When Christ reigns in his full glory, so how do we enter into God's kingdom at the end? Well, as the scripture says, and I repeat, we inherit the kingdom. Not through a sound investment plan and strategy, it's out of our control. We do not earn it, Jesus said, inherit it. It's not something that we will claim or win or own. You have no power whatsoever in any form or shape to bring about the change in what's going to happen later. We have inherited the salvation. The words in the scripture says, through the grace of God, through the faith in Jesus Christ, Apostle Paul speaks about that. Now, it doesn't mean that in some, somehow I get to utter Jesus, Jesus, and Jesus three times, and I get to heaven, I get to go to heaven, and, and the other person would not because he wanted to say, but couldn't because he died suddenly before he had a chance to say the name Jesus. I mean, that's a nonsense, isn't it? That's a nonsense. Well, let me tell you a story. It is the custom among Catholics to confess their sins to a priest and receive absolution from him as a sign of God's forgiveness. Now, all too often, there is the danger that penitents will use this as a sort of guarantee, a certificate that will protect them from divine retribution, thereby placing more trust in the absolution of the priest than in the mercy of God. So this is what Perigen, an Italian painter of the Middle Ages, was tempted to do when he was dying. He decided that he would not go to confession if, in his fear, he was seeking to save his skin. That would be sacrilege and an insult to God. 
Now his wife, who knew nothing of the man's inner disposition, once asked him if he did not fear to die unconfessed. And Perigen replied, Hey, honey, look at this way, my dear. My profession is to paint, and I have ex excelled as a painter. God's profession is to forgive, and if he's good at his profession as I have been at mine, I see no reason to be afraid. Salvation is a free gift. You cannot earn it. You can claim it with good deeds. Not the slightest chance to keep a score of our deeds in order to qualify. Based on today's text from Matthew, the righteous ones, the righteous ones, they hadn't kept score. They don't know their own deeds. Maybe they did call them good deeds, maybe not. Often, the right hand doesn't know what their left hand is doing. They did what they did because of the necessity to help, love, serve, visit, feed, because they had been helped, loved, served, visited, and fed. And they were infused, like you infuse a turkey with a butter, with the oil of gladness, the spirit poured into their hearts, and they simply did what they did. The unrighteous ones know what they are doing, they kept score of how many times they helped others, the amount they gave. They made sure their picture was in the paper for serving at a soup kitchen, attending a charity ball, and they knew what compelled them to help. Social pressure, the desire for recognition. And this, someday I may be in that position, God forbid, and I hope someone will help me. Saints are not aware of their good deeds. The saints are not aware that they are saints. The sinners need to be aware that they are sinners. But sainthoods, it is given and assumed without being recognized by the saints. I mean, Mother Teresa has never called herself a saint. She never considered herself as a saint. She just served, fed, clothed, and she did all this with joy, with thanksgiving, with deep love. But we all know that she is a saint of saints. Our salvation is out of our control. Kingdom later is out of our control. We cannot do anything about it. We will be, all be there and be judged. We can't do anything about it. So why would you even worry about the judgment? Why would you even worry about something that is totally out of your control? But I know what I can do now. I know what's in my control. I can work to shape the world to be a better place to live. I can work to be a sign of God's reign here and now. That I can do. That's what the kingdom of God is here and now. The eternal kingdom of God is here and now. Not just when we die. God's rule is everlasting here to eternity. Now and after the death. In the time of final judgment, when God comes with power, it's clear end. But God is coming to us even now and here. But some of us will miss, miss that totally. Because it comes to us in disguise coming to us through the most unexpected ways. Christ is coming to us even now among the least of these. He will come in the glory later, but he is coming to us even now in the dumps among the poor. He will be coming with the mighty angels later, but now he is coming in the back street alley among street angels, among the homeless, in the form of drunken people, in the disguise of drunken person, in the form of malnourished children, in a darkened, isolated room of a lonely elder. He is coming among them. The kingdom of his coming, God is found among the least of these now, when Jesus comes with the glory, when Christ reigns, we will not make any mistakes. Everyone will know. Still, now, kingdom of God is coming to us, and we might just totally miss the signs because we are looking for the kingdom of God in all the wrong places. 
So our task and our call right now are to reframe our thinking, shake our brains and our hearts like when you shake a crystal snowflake, you know, small little ball, boom, to rattle our brains and shake our hearts so that we are turned upside and down to prepare us to see and embrace these little signs of the kingdom of God breaking into our lives, happening under our radar. And as we begin to see and hear the signs of Christ coming among the least of these, we also become the signs of the kingdom of God by serving, helping, feeding, infusing the word with joy. We become a beacon of hope and healing in a divided and broken world. And maybe then, the world will begin to notice, begin to glimpse and embrace the kingdom come in Jesus Christ now and here and later at the end.